Hello and welcome to this Property Hub University course. I'm Rob D, and I'm about to take you through a course called Leverage Plus Discount Plus Time, the property investor's magic formula. By the end, you're gonna be thinking a bit differently and that's exciting. So here's what we're gonna cover. We'll cover the ingredient that turns property from an average investment into a great investment. We'll learn why property prices don't need to boom for you to make big profits. We'll learn the three times rule for calculating your potential returns. I like that one, that's a favorite bit of mine. We're gonna learn how to control your risks while keeping the reward, very important. And finally, we'll see why achieving a discount at purchase is so powerful. So let's get started and let's start by answering a question that might seem like a, such an obvious answer, it doesn't even deserve to be asked, which is, is property the best investment? Surely it is, otherwise why am I spending my time doing something called Property Hub? Well. Let's have a little look, shall we? Is property the best investment? So this graph is taken from a report by a wealth management firm called Schroders, and it's showing you what £100,000 invested 25 years ago would be worth today. Um, so it's a few years old, um, not entirely up to date, but the pattern today wouldn't be wildly different. You can see that London has done the best, Yorkshire has done the worst, and the UK average, as you'd expect, is somewhere in the middle. So your £100,000 investment from 25 years ago would have become just over 400,000 pounds. Interesting bit about this graph is the bar that I've chopped off the end, which is this one, global equities. In other words, stock market investment. So if you invested in an index fund, the biggest companies in the entire world, and you had a good degree of diversification, what would you get? Well, the answer is it would outperform the UK average and it would outperform the best performing region in the UK. Over the last 25 years, global equities vastly outperformed property. So what is going on here? Why are we even talking about property as an investment? All you need to do is buy into an index fund and you would have outperformed what property would have achieved even if you invested in the best area. Well, the answer to that is that when you're looking at shares and property, which is a comparison that's made all the time, it's hotly debated, comparisons usually ignore leverage. And leverage, of course, is the first ingredient in that magic formula that we're looking at today. Now, to a degree, that's fair enough. One has got leverage and the other hasn't. Um, that's not a fair comparison. But the reality of the situation is that when you do invest in property, it's very normal to use leverage and you can quite safely use a fairly high degree of leverage. It's a normal thing to do. You can use leverage for stock market investments, but it's very unusual for your average retail investor to do. And because of the, the volatility and the way it all works, it's a lot more risky. So normally you do use leverage when it comes to property and you don't when it comes to the stock market. So I do think even though I'm fully acknowledging that it's not an entirely direct comparison, by actually using leverage when you're looking at your property returns, you're getting a better sense of what would actually happen if you were the average investor in property. And this is the result. As you can see, when you apply leverage to your property investments, global equities have suddenly gone from being the best performer to the worst performer. It's now drastically lagging even the worst performing region of the UK. So that is the difference that leverage makes. It's absolutely huge. So that's it at kind of a high level, but we can try to quantify this a little bit more and calculate the impact that leverage has. And a way of doing that is by looking at ROI, return on investment. This is something I'm sure you'll have come across before. It's a very simple calculation. It's simply the amount that you make from a property divided by the amount of your own money that you put in. So if you use a mortgage, that doesn't count. It's not the purchase price, it's the amount of your own money that you put in. Now, ROI, people normally talk about this in terms of what you're generating month to month in terms of rental income. But if you're looking at the total return on investment, then you're really looking at two things. You're looking at the income return plus the capital return. In other words, the capital growth that the property is achieving. It's those two things, it's the capital value and it's the rent that make up the total return that you get from an investment. So what I'm gonna do for almost the rest of this course is completely ignore the income return. You'll barely hear me mention income from now onwards. So yes, you are collecting the rent and yes, you can use ROI to measure the return on investment that you're making as a result of the rent coming in. But let's park that and let's look at the capital return instead. And it's when you add both of those up that you get your true total ROI. So let's figure out how this all works uh, for a couple of different types of purchases. We'll start with an all cash purchase, which is very straightforward. So you've got a property 
that you buy for £200,000 or cash and after some period of time, let's say a year to keep it simple, it's gone up in value to £220,000. You therefore of course made a £20,000 gain which is a 10% ROI. It's the £20,000 gain divided by the £200,000 that you put in. Let's look now at a purchase that you make instead with a 75% mortgage. So in this scenario, same £200,000 property, but you're only putting down £50,000 as a deposit, so 25% of the total purchase price. But then there are some other costs to throw in there as well. So you've got £7,500 for stamp duty at the time of recording, and let's say two and a half thousand pounds for legal fees and other costs that you incur in the purchase so that means in terms of the cash that you are putting in out of your own pocket you're putting down sixty thousand pounds in total so that property you put down sixty thousand you it's worth two hundred thousand at the time you buy it a year later again let's say it's gone up to two hundred and twenty thousand pounds so again that's a gain of twenty thousand pounds but this time, we're dividing that £20,000 gain by the amount of money that you put in, same as before, but this time the amount of money that you put in is less. The amount you put in is £60,000. So if you divide 20 by 60, you get 33.3. So the ROI has increased from 10% to 33 and a third percent. This pattern broadly holds regardless of the, the value of the property. Yes, the stamp duty kind of bans are going to change a bit and you might have differences in legal fees and other costs, but as long as you keep the leverage level at 75%, then the numbers are pretty much the same. So what that means is to see the impact of 75% leverage, you can just multiply by three. So what actually happened before was we went from 10% to 33 and a third percent. So it's a bit more than multiplied by three, but it rounds it down to be cautious and it makes the maths a heck of a lot easier, which I'm a fan of. So what that means is, as we've just seen, if you've got um, a normal kind of return on an all cash purchase of 10%, then it becomes 30%. Like I said, in our case, 33 and a third, but still close enough. If you see get 15% without leverage, then with leverage, that takes you to 45%. And even if you only achieve a gain of 5%, well, thanks to leverage, you multiply it by three and you get to 15%. That is quite a big difference. And that goes a long way to explaining the graphs that I showed back at the start and why suddenly equities where you're not using leverage went from being the best performing to the worst performing investment. So leverage, you can say, turns bad years good and good years great. So this chart shows the 12 month percentage change in property prices over a period of time sort of going back to about 2007 or so so you can see the crash in there very clearly um, so this is the average 12 month change in property prices and what you can see is what, where I've put the orange line anything above that line shows that you're making a 5% annual return in terms of your capital growth or more so above the orange line you're making five percent or more below you're making less than five percent and as you can see you're, you're achieving that some of the time but not most of the time it's only certain years where that's happening however the green line shows years in which you would have made more than a five percent annual return in terms of capital growth if you'd use 75 percent leverage and that's because we're multiplying our returns by three so the bar almost literally in this case is lower so as you can see the majority of the time we're above the green line so really before it was only the, the good years when you're topping five percent but now in the average years you're doing it as well and it's only really in the in the bad years in the the, the real slumps when you're not achieving that and that's what I mean by turning bad years good and good years great. And here's yet another way of looking at the power of leverage. Even if property prices only go up by 2% per year on average from now onwards for the rest of time, which is just in line with what inflation is supposed to be and slower than prices have ever gone up before, then if you multiply that 2% by 3, you're still growing at 6% before you've counted a penny in rent. And I think that's really powerful because by looking at it this way, you're basically throwing out anything special in terms of property prices. Property prices are not outperforming general inflation. Assets aren't doing anything special. You haven't done anything special in terms of buying in a particularly great area or buying a property where you've added any value or where you're able to get it at a discount. None of that has happened. But even so, even if, you're, if property is only growing in line with general inflation, 
then because of the power of leverage, you're kind of starting at 6% and then you're kind of adding your rent and everything else on top of that. And inflation, as a reminder, is supposed to be 2%. That's the target, but at the time of recording, it's substantially higher than that. So if property prices only grew with outline inflation, then you'd be doing far, far, far better. We can also look at a real example um, to show what leverage can do for you. And um, this is a, a real property that I bought um, and it's what I call an underperforming purchase that's making 10% a year. So I bought this property five years ago for £128,000. These days I'd say it's worth about £150,000. Maybe it's a little bit more because I haven't checked on the value for probably over six months and the property market's done well in that time. But let's just say that it's now worth £150,000. That's an increase of 17% over the time that I've owned it, which annualised works out to only 3.4% per year which really isn't that exciting, is it? <laughs> like 3.4% a year, given that the property market's been doing really well and given that supposedly I know what I'm doing, 3.4% is nothing to write home about. But conveniently, um, because I use 75% leverage, I can multiply that by three. And that means that this property has achieved an annualized capital ROI of more than 10%, 10.2% for me which is really pretty good because this is a pretty average property in a pretty average location. It's not been the world's most spectacular investment by any means. And it's been over a period of time where the property market has been very unexciting. The, over the last 12 months, it's really kicked on. But prior to that, it hadn't done a lot at all. And even taking into all that into account, I've still managed to top 10% a year on my investment, which I'm very, very happy with. As it happens, remember we haven't talked about the rent at all. As it happens, this property rents really well. The, the rental ROI is really good. So it's, it's a lot better than it looks. But even without taking the rent into account at all, we're still north of 10%. And that's mostly thanks to leverage. Now I did promise that we'd talk about the downside of leverage and you have to because leverage is powerful and it's powerful in both directions. Let losses are multiplied by three as well. You can't have the good without having the bad. Leverage is it's a multiplier. That's what it is. And so you're going to find that when the market's doing well, um, it really helps you out when the market's doing badly. It affects you far worse than if you hadn't used leverage at all and you were just buying it purely with cash. And what that means is over a long-term hold, you do need to offset any drops against the gains. So you need to be prepared for that. You can't say, oh, well, amazing, I'm going to get... 15% or whatever you work out every single year forever. No, you're not. There are going to be years occasionally when property prices fall. We've got a course on the 18 year cycle, which you really should watch if you haven't done already. And when that happens, you're going to be hit three times as hard. That's just how it goes. There's several different things that you need to factor in to when you're thinking about that. Um, what can you do about it? Well, one is you can avoid making new investments towards the peak. Another thing you can do is before a crash, you can refinance to pull out cash. So even if your portfolio value falls, then the amount of cash that you've invested has also decreased, which therefore increases your ROI and kind of offsets the effect. Of course, the, the third thing that you can do is sell before the peak and then buy back in after the crash has happened, if you're smart enough and brave enough. I suggest you're probably not. I don't know you, but I'm not, and most people aren't. If you can manage to, to get the timing right and pull it off, then that is the absolute best thing to do. You're then benefiting from leverage all the way through the positive parts of the cycle, cashing in, getting out, and waiting for everything to fall and doing it all again. That way you get the upside of leverage without the downside, but that is considerably easier said than done. So that's a lot said about leverage. And leverage deserves to have a lot said about it because it is such a powerful tool. And hopefully you, you've seen that now because I've illustrated that in several different ways. But it's not the only one. So we can talk about time as well. So let's talk about time. This is the second magic ingredient for a couple of reasons. The first is you need to have time to get the upside. Like it takes time for leverage and capital growth to work its magic. If you own a property for six months, you're not gonna see much in the way of that upside. So you need time. But time also mitigates your downside. And this is an important point. As long as you're not forced to sell, time repairs mistakes and undoes unfortunate events. And 
this is really interesting if you look at an example, which is what we're going to do now. This is the story of a terribly timed investment. This is the, literally the worst investment that you could have made in recent years. So what we're looking here is what would happen if you'd bought the average UK property in January 2008. January 2008 is the worst month that you could have brought property in recent memory because that was the high point. That was just before the property market absolutely crashed. So you're buying at the worst time in January. A year later, here's why it's the worst time, that property that you bought for 185 is now gonna be worth 157. That is a fall in the property market of 15% of the average UK property. So a 15% drop in a year is pretty bad. <laughs> and then because you use leverage, it's worse. So because remember, your losses are multiplied by three as well. So you've got a negative 45% ROI a year later. Then let's imagine that you, you weren't forced to sell. You kept the faith, you, you didn't sell at the loss and kind of lock in that loss that you experienced every year. And you held on to that property for 10 years, but you still own the property in January 2018. And by that point, the property is worth £224,000. Then let's imagine that you sold it at that point. 10 years is enough for you. You've only just got over the trauma of that first year. You just don't want to even be reminded of that anymore. So you get rid of it in January 18. That gives you a total growth over the 10 years of £39,000. In percentage terms, that is a growth um, of, of 21% which is not that exciting at all. Like it's just over 2% a year. That is not anything to write home about. And th there's two reasons for that. One is that you, you had that huge crash that you needed to recover from, but also it just flat out wasn't a very exciting time for, for property investment. Even when the market came back, it really just kind of went sideways for a long time. So that gives you 21% over the 10 years. But remember you use leverage. And so your ROI over those 10 years is 63%. So your annualized ROI is 6.3%. 6.3%, again, is not exactly spectacular. But remember, this is a property that you bought at the worst possible time you could have bought, the worst month in the worst year. And then you sold it a decade later after the market had not done anything that exciting. And in fact, it's really the sort of the last 18 months or so that the market has really kicked on. And if you'd have just held on, you would have seen way more growth than this, but you didn't, you sold it at a pretty bad time as well. And even taking all that into account, you've still, thanks to leverage, achieved 6.3%. And again, that is before counting any rent at all, because you would have been collecting rent for those 10 years, but just on the capital side, 6.3%. And that is thanks to leverage, but it's also thanks to time. It's time that gave that allowed the market to come back. If you'd gone into this investment with sort of a two or three year horizon, and for some reason you had to sell after that time, you would have come out with a loss. But because of time, Time allows mistakes to be worked through and sort of crashes to come back from. The property market goes up most of the time. It's just when it falls, it falls quite dramatically. And that's why it's so important that you need to not be forced to sell. And by not being forced to sell, it allows time to work its magic. Let's move on to the final ingredient of the magic formula, which is discount. Let's look at the power of a discount. To illustrate the power of a discount, we'll look at a real deal that we did with um, our company, Property Hub Invest. This, this was a block of properties that we acquired for our investors. If you don't know what Property Hub Invest is, I'm sure there'll be a link to it somewhere around this video, or you can go to propertyhub.net slash invest. We managed to acquire these properties in Trafford in Greater Manchester, for which the market value was £270,000. And when you're looking at a discount, it's very important that it is a real discount. And by that, I mean it's a discount from, not just a discount from the asking price, but a discount from the actual market value. So the market value here is 270,000 pounds. We knew that because 270 units had already been sold at that price. So that established that the market value clearly was 270. 
We then managed to, but to purchase these or allow our investors to purchase this, these for an average purchase price of £240,000. Some units were different, some were a little bit more, some a little bit less, but the average purchase price was £240,000, which is an 11% discount. So again, the, we knew that the market value was 270, therefore the purchase price of 240 is an 11% discount. If they'd just marked the market value up to, to, to 295, and then sold them to us for 270 that would look like a discount but it's not a genuine discount and that's why i make this point that it's very easy to, to convince yourself that you've got a discount because you've got a discount from the asking price but if the asking price has just been inflated and it's not the market value then you haven't really got a discount so that is an important point the power a discount is powerful but it has to be a genuine discount so in this case it was we, we secured this discount we're confident in it and so as an investor coming in to buy one of these properties they'd be putting in a, an average of seventy thousand six hundred and fifty pounds which is the deposit the stamp duty and all other purchase related costs now we can look at what that investment would have grow, grown to over five years time we haven't had five years yet it's been less than a year so we don't know what the outcome is going to be but we can see based on um, based on the figures we can see what the outcome could be based on different levels of average annual price growth so what this table shows you is like what would happen over five years with annual price growth of two percent on average four percent on average six eight or ten percent so Probably it's going to fall somewhere in the middle, right? So if you manage to do five years averaging 10% a year each, that would be pretty blockbuster. Not something you'd expect to see. But also, on average, over five years of 2% um, a year on average is pretty poor. So it's probably going to fall somewhere in between. But the point is, you can kind of you can decide for yourself based on what you think the market's going to do. Um, and you can so so you can see if you do get growth of say 2% on average every year for five years, then the market value um, of the property which they bought for 240 but was worth 270 has increased to 298 thousand pounds. That would give a total ROI over the period of 40% or an annualised ROI of 8%. If you then go up to 6%, then that property that was bought for 240, worth 270 at the time, now worth 361, that's a total ROI of 199% and an annualised ROI of 26% a year which is really pretty good. And the reason that these numbers are looking so good, you can see this very clearly when you look at the 2% scenario, because as we've seen, price growth of 2%, normally you'd multiply by three. So that would get you to an annualized ROI of 6%. But here it's 8%. Those extra two percentage points come from the discount. So that discount has given an extra 2% annualized ROI every year. So that's pretty good. And that's why if you can achieve a discount, it's the discount is not as important as the time. It's not as important as the leverage. But if you can achieve it, then you can see in the 2% scenario, it's added an extra 2% a year to your annualized ROI, which is pretty good. And remember, all of these scenarios do not include any rental income again. So again, we're seeing this pattern of, well, if you can, if you can achieve these things, if you can use the leverage, if you can get a discount, if you can allow a little bit of time, even just five years, then even without anything spectacular happening in the property market whatsoever, even if growth is averaging 2%, which again is super, super low, then you're still at 8% here. And if you added your rent on top, then you'd be going above 10%, you'd assume even without the property market doing much at all. So what have we learned? One thing that we've definitely learned is that you don't have to use leverage, but it's a property investment superpower. If you're not using leverage, I'd almost suggest that it's just not worth investing in property, or at least not inv worth investing in property in this way. If you are going to add value to properties um, by refurbishing them, if you're going to flip properties to make a quick profit, any of these things, fine, you can use property for that. But if you're investing for the long term in this kind of hands-off way that we talk about, then you really should be using leverage because if not, well, you kind of might as well just go and invest in the stock market and you'll do just as well without any of the hassle at all. So it really is a property investment superpower. And this is a point that it's worth emphasizing because so many people are 
uncomfortable with leverage. They're uncomfortable with the idea of debt. They feel like it's risky. And it is more risky. It just is. We've talked about some of the discounts, but the upside is really there. So if you can learn to control the downside in some of the ways that we've talked about and, you, and get comfortable with getting into that position where you're not forced to sell, which is the important bit, then you really can benefit from leverage and know that if you use time and you use it and you've got enough time, then even if you get the negative effects of leverage, there's still time for it to all work itself out. We've also learned that multiplying by three is a handy way to calculate the gain that you get from capital growth assuming you're using a 75% mortgage. So that's quite a neat little shortcut. Again, it's conservative because as we saw in the example, it was more than that, but a nice little shortcut that I enjoy using. And as a result, we learned that if you use leverage and you invest for the long term, you can make a great ROI without needing property prices to grow like crazy. We've seen what happens even if property prices just grow at 2% a year. And if we get years like the ones that we've had recently, where property prices are growing by far more than that, well, then it does get quite exciting. We've also learned that time rescues even badly timed purchases. I've found that that example so powerful. If you're buying at the absolute peak, you would not be in a happy position a year later. But 10 years later, you're in a pretty good position. You'd rather have not made that particular purchase at that time. Of course, if you'd had the knowledge of what was going to happen or if you were aware of the property cycle, so we're picking up on the signs that we were towards the peak, then you wouldn't have bought in January 2008. You would have waited, the market would have fallen, and then you would have, of course, done far better over the next 10 years because you would have been starting from a lower base. But even without any of that, without making any kind of any knowledge about what the property market's going to do is rescued thanks to time. And finally, discount. We've learned that discounts aren't essential. Everything that we've just talked about doesn't involve a discount at all, but they do juice your returns even further. So if you can manage to combine all three of these, if you can get a discount, use the leverage and give it some time, well, it's called a magic formula for a reason because you really can get some very special returns without doing anything particularly clever without taking any big risks and without making a big effort. So I hope you've enjoyed this course and I hope it's produced a bit of a mindset shift for you in the same way as it did for me. I've really enjoyed it because it does emphasize that capital growth aspect, which is not something that I came to property investment really appreciating. And I think it's the same for a lot of people. So hopefully I'm not saying that, oh, forget about rental income, it's not important. It absolutely is important. But hopefully this gives you a kind of a, a bit more of a balanced sense about where the returns can come from as a result of long-term property investment investment and some of the little tools and the tricks and the ideas to keep in mind to really help you understand what long-term property investment is all about. So thank you again for taking this course. There's plenty more in Property Hub University so do go check out our other courses and I'll see you again soon.